The subordinate soldiers began gathering supplies and figuring out how best to carry them. Marx rifled through the communications desk, shoving papers into his jacket front. Communiques, most likely, and sensitive information. There was no way he would be able to get it all, but Minnie left him to it while the others worked. For her part, she began shifting the barricade. Cresswell, a shovel gripped in one hand, helped her. How long do we have? Until the ghouls find us? No telling. The sooner we leave, the better. Swift came up behind them, a lantern in one hand and a shovel in the other. There's only three, he said, lifting the tool in his grip. He, at least, seemed to have regained his composure. Minnie nodded, then paused. Captain, do you have a sword? Marks took up a lantern and examined it with a critical eye. Yes, but it's ceremonial. I'm not a skilled fencer either, I'm afraid. You don't need to be. I'll be using it. Can you get it? Marks went to retrieve it himself from his belongings. He offered it to her hilt first. It drew smoothly from its scabbard, long and thin, though not as thin as the foils she had used in her schooling. It was a cut and thrust weapon, not meant to chop through bone, but it might be effective against ghouls in more advanced states of decay. She wished fervently then that the Order had issued her one of their swords, weapons of magic as much as steel. One of them would cleave through ghouls like a hot knife through soft butter, regardless of their stage of decomposition or the strength of the sorcery animating them. But the war had already made resources scarce, and her enchanted arrows and spelled dagger were even less useful in this context than the length of dead steel in her hand. At least the sword had reach. Minnie could feel time slipping away as viscerally as she could the bead of sweat trickling down the back of her neck. She surveyed the room one last time, and the men in it. Three of the four privates held their shovels close with tight-lipped determination, and more than a little terror. The last, Cresswell had called him Sultan, held his bayonet and trench knife ready, much as Swift had when they'd first tumbled into the room. Marks was quickly setting papers alight from the lantern flame and tossing them onto the earthen floor to burn. Outside, there was very little sound, only the occasional groan and dying howl of a wounded man meeting his final fate. She took a breath and tightened her fingers around the sword hilt. Let's go. Together, Cresswell and Swift pushed the last desk away from the bunker door with one synchronized thrust. It swung open, a mangled corpse thumping across the threshold as it did. The body of the man they'd heard minutes before beating at the door. There were others clustered in the trench behind him, people who had been running for the bunker but fell just short to the grasping, implacable grip of ghouls. Those same ghouls that loitered now in the trench, one four yards to their left and two more six yards to their right. The single ghoul looked fresh, while the other two both had blackened skin sloughing away from ragged uniforms, soiled by mud and filth beyond recognition. All three of them were turning toward the oasis of life that now appeared so suddenly before them. Go right, Minnie yelled, and charged toward the two older corpses. There was a way out somewhere down the line, if she could just remember how far. One of the ghouls released a rattling hiss and raised its arms to meet her. Minnie didn't hesitate as she brought the sword down in an arc. The blow cleaved both arms from its rotten torso, less by cutting and more by knocking the bones free from their rotted joints. The sharp tip of the blade cut a deep gash in its breast, though, and a putrid stench exploded from its chest cavity. Minnie's stomach violently clenched, and her throat closed, lungs refusing to breathe the noxious fumes of death. Beside her, Swift slammed the flat of the shovel against the second ghoul and shoved Minnie forward, even as he gagged too. They staggered past. Behind them, Minnie heard the others using their own shovels to bludgeon the ghouls away long enough for them to dart along. The duck boards were slick with mud, making it impossible to flee at a dead run. They slipped and slid as they scurried down the trench. They might not be going very fast, but neither were the ghouls. The mud was as much a hindrance to them as to their living prey. But unlike many in the soldiers, they could not be tired by it, nor would they be injured if they fell. 
There's a turn somewhere. Minnie gasped, still purging her lungs of putrid <laughs> air. Swift nodded sharply. I know which one. Faster, Chandra urged. They're coming! Their half-shuffling, half-jogging pace picked up to a precarious trot. There were more bodies here, scattered across the mud and duckboards, more opportunities to trip and fall and never get up again, more fodder for the sorcerer to raise. Evidence, too, that there were probably more ghouls nearby. Ghouls like the ones that were now rising from their haunches ahead, where they'd crouched next to the fresh corpses and smeared their bloated faces with fresh blood that would feed the magic animating them and make them stronger. There! Swift gestured to an intersection ahead, closer to them than the new cluster of ghouls by about twelve yards. Be ready, Minnie cautioned, trying to keep an eye on both the ghouls ahead and the obstacles underfoot. There might be some just around the corner. That was when they heard the first reports of new gunfire and a fresh flurry of screams. The support line had sent troops forward to investigate, and the unfortunate souls had just met the new enemy. In a slipping, sliding huddle, they turned into a straightaway leading to the back half of the front line. They were met by the sight of three shambling corpses just ahead of them, their movements aimless until they sensed fresh quarry. Don't stop, Minnie said, raising her sword to guard. Just get past. Just keep going. She tried not to look too closely at the ghouls as they shoved past, shovels thudding against wet, spongy chests. But she did glance back and one look told her all she needed to know. The ghouls were turning to pursue them, and the others they had left behind earlier were beginning to round the corner from the front-line trench into theirs. Faster! Captain Marks urged. We must go faster! He was right. Minnie's pace picked up. Her boot soles slipped on the slick duckboards, and she clenched the muscles in her legs that she might when venturing out onto a frozen pond in winter. It seemed to help. But it was not enough, because it only took one wrong step to spell disaster. In her case, it happened because she could hear the ghouls gaining, their clumsy yet relentless tread clobbering the duckboards behind them. She turned to look and... Ah! Her left foot skidded off the boards and into the thick, sucking mud, her boots sinking up to the ankle. With a half-wild huff of effort, she wrenched her one foot free, but even that brief pause brought the pack of ghouls closer. As if sensing an opening, they threw themselves forward, rushing at them down the duckboards. This is it, Minnie thought grimly. This is how I die. If she had been killed by the vampire, it would have been fast. Falling out of that tree, she'd had no time to really contemplate her demise. The vamp would have wasted no time in drinking her down. It would have been quick, but this, this was worse. The dread that had been crawling under her skin sank deeper, became a sharper, more terrible thing writhing against her insides. The slow, steady building of panic in her brain roared up in a fever pitch of terrible inevitability. The ghouls neared in their mad, drunken tumble, trailing veils of eager flies after them. Their jaws, if they still had any, were slack and wet with blood and older ichor, their hungry hands reaching and gleaming with mud and rot. Minnie was limping backwards, the men behind her, one last cry of anger and despair rising in her throat when something sailed over her shoulder and thudded against the chest of the leading ghoul. Bollocks, Sultan hissed behind her. They all stared at the lantern now lying in the mud at the ghoul's feet. It hadn't broken on impact, as they'd all hoped. The ghoul itself seemed barely phased as it lurched forward again. Then its foot came down on the lantern and glass crunched under its uneven tread. And suddenly, miraculously, a gout of flame shot up its leg. The oil reservoir burst, hemorrhaging most of its fuel onto the duckboards, but jetting some of it out onto the nearby ghouls. And just like that, the tables turned. Fire spread along the duckboards following the path of oil, and another ghoul caught, and another. The cry in Minnie's throat turned into a cheer, one which quickly died again, because now they had a new problem. Fire might destroy ghouls, but it didn't do so instantly. 
And now they had a bunch of flaming, albeit slower, corpses in front of them, and another group approaching behind them. Their situation had improved only marginally, and one could make a good argument that it hadn't improved at all. The only difference was that now they had just a few moments more of time. While the men were trying to figure out how to use the lanterns to better effect, many glanced around. Some of the ghouls might fall inert before they could reach them, but others wouldn't. The group behind them was still advancing, and even if the men could use the lanterns to ignite those, the same would still be true, and the ghouls were too numerous to fight through effectively. That left only one slightly less terrible option. Up. If only they had more time, they could wait for the cover of darkness to make their escape. If only there were less ghouls, they could fight their way through without leaving the safety of the trench. If only there weren't any ghouls or sorcerers or heinous magic in this war, they wouldn't be in this awful mess. If only there wasn't a war. But there was a war, and there were sorcerers and ghouls, and there wasn't enough time to wait. It was either go up and probably die, or stay put and definitely die. Captain! Minnie gestured at a set of steep steps laid into the trench wall going up. His face, already pale, whitened further. He opened his mouth to protest, then closed it and nodded. There was no sense in arguing. They had to reach the support trenches before they too were completely overcome by ghouls, then call a retreat to the reserve line. Only then could they regroup and hope to mitigate this unthinkable disaster. It was their best and only option. To the north and west, perhaps a quarter mile distant, a new smattering of gunfire and shouted commands pelted the air. More evidence that time was swiftly running out. Men, Captain Mark said, bringing their harried conversations to a halt. It's time. Up and over. A hush fell over them, bringing a horribly sober moment of clarity. This wasn't the war they imagined fighting when they signed up, but it was the one they found themselves waging. And the bitter truth about war was this. Not everyone made it home alive. And nobody made it home the same. The unfairness of it was staggering. There was no worse enemy than that simple truth. And no foe so entirely unbeatable. Cresswell was the first to climb and the first to fall. The Germans in their trench were waiting, had been waiting all along, to pick off any stragglers that tried to flee above ground. Shots sounded sharp in the air, and with a cry Cresswell fell into the patchy grass and mud. In front of Minnie, Sultan shied back from the last few steps, new terror blazing his eyes. Around them the stench of decaying and burning corpses was growing unbearable, and Minnie felt the captain, Chandra, and Swift pressing into her back as they shrank away from the encroaching horde. Soldier! The captain bellowed. Move your bloody ass! That's an order! Sultan whimpered, tried to move, but his legs wobbled beneath him and he nearly slid back into Minnie. She gritted her teeth, her own limbs trembling, her own heart rabbiting beneath her breast. Stay low. Just stay low. Behind her, Swift yelled. A wet whack sounded, and another as he swung his shovel blade and cut the reaching arms from the leading ghoul. The dead were upon them. When Sultan still didn't move, Minnie shoved him. He lurched up onto the ground and instantly fell into a flat-bellied crawl, half-coherent swears and sobs streaming from his lips. Then it was Minnie's turn. She didn't give herself time to think. She threw herself onto the grass and started crawling, even as the pops of gunfire and shrieks of bullets intensified overhead. She couldn't think, or she would stop entirely. Just crawl over the grass. Crawl around Cresswell. Don't look into his lifeless eyes. Crawl. 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 Crawl and hope the ghouls weren't coordinated enough to climb, and the Germans were unlucky shots. Crawl, damn it! The deep boom didn't register at first. The sound of mortars was so ubiquitous to this conflict that it didn't seem all that unusual, at least to Minnie's already overtaxed nerves, especially since it was the right time of day for the evening hate. 
that daily exchange of bullets and shells that was already becoming a defining characteristic of this war. But then the ground beneath me jumped, knocking the breath from her, and clods of earth rained down on her back, striking her with bruising strength. Another boom, another earthquake, and Minnie stopped moving and pressed her face into the earth as more soil clanged against her helmet and rattled her skull. The booming went on, amplifying her fear with every brutal shudder of the ground and rendering her incapable of anything but breathing. Then, above the damp smell of displaced earth and the harsh, burnt scent of gunpowder, a different smell bloomed. Minnie tilted her chin and peered from beneath the lip of her helmet through squinted eyes. Smoke was rising around her and drifting across the ground, and it suddenly occurred to her that it wasn't from the burning ghouls, but from a smoke round fired from their own support trenches. Blissful cover, just for them, so they could make a dash to the safety of the trench. She started to her feet, but another mortar blast rocked the ground. A grip caught her elbow before she buckled entirely. Beside her, Swift tugged her upright and pulled her along as they half crouched, half ran across the broken earth. There never was a longer quarter mile. Minnie kept her eyes on the ground, kept her focus on keeping her feet beneath her, and let Swift do the navigating. And then they were plunging down into the trench, hands helping them, softening their fall. Suddenly, there were so many people, all running, all shouting, and Minnie stood in the middle, watching as the soldiers piled up crates and barrels and anything else they could find to barricade the north stretch of the trench. Captain Marks, a livid streak of blood garishly bright against the side of his face, was yelling commands. A little ways away, Chandra crouched and worked the wireless, his fingers tapping out a message with quick precision. Minnie looked, but didn't see Sultan anywhere. We're preparing to fall back. Minnie blinked and forced herself to focus. Captain Marks stood next to her, palming the blood oozing over his dark brow away from his eye. We'll shell the front trenches before we abandon the artillery. Set up some quick grenade traps as we retreat. Between those and the barricades, that should slow the dead down. There was an unspoken sentiment attached. Hopefully, for long enough, before the Germans can surge through the broken line. Because this, this catastrophic breach, it could cost them the whole war. All because Captain Marks had refused to burn his dead until it was too late. <laughs>